Thank you, Jen. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm here to provide a brief update on the situation with respect to Russia and Ukraine. We've now completed an intensive week of diplomacy in multiple formats, the Strategic Stability Dialogue, the NATO-Russia Council, and the OSCE. Russia raised its concerns. We raised our concerns, including the actions Russia has taken to undermine European security uh, that Secretary Blinken spoke so eloquently about last week. We stuck to our core premise of reciprocity. We were firm in our principles and clear about those areas where we can make progress and those areas that are non-starters. Allied unity and transatlantic solidarity were on full display, and they remain on full display. The discussions were frank and direct. They were useful. They gave us and our allies things to consider. They gave Russia things to consider. We will now reflect and consult with allies and partners on how to proceed. We're prepared to continue with diplomacy to advance security and stability in the Euro-Atlantic. We're equally prepared if Russia chooses a different path. We continue to coordinate intensively with partners on severe economic measures in response to a further Russian invasion of Ukraine. We continue to work with allies at NATO on changes in force posture and capabilities, especially on NATO's eastern flank, if that scenario arises. And we continue to support Ukraine and the Ukrainian people in the defense of their sovereignty and territorial integrity. We have been very clear with Russia on the costs and consequences of further military action or destabilization in Ukraine. So we're ready either way. We're ready to make progress at the negotiating table, serious, tangible progress on important issues of concern to us, to Europe, and to Russia in an environment of, es of de-escalation. And we're ready to take the necessary and proper steps to defend our allies, support our partners, and respond robustly to any naked aggression that might occur. In our view, diplomacy is the more sensible path. The Russians will have to make their own assessment. In terms of next steps in the diplomatic process, we'll remain engaged with allies and partners and with the Russians and make determinations in the coming days about what comes next. I'm going to leave it there and be happy to take your questions. Is there an yeah. agreement to hold more talks with the Russians, Jake? There are no dates set for any more talks. We have to consult with allies and partners first. We're in communication with the Russians, and we'll see what comes next. Jake, yeah. uh, can you address uh, this Debbie Farm Minister's comments to, to wrap up, suggesting that the U.S. Uh, that the, that Russia could deploy forces or wouldn't rule out deploying forces um, in, in Latin America? Is that something that the U.S. is concerned about? Is that something that came up in those discussions? I'm not going to respond to bluster in the public commentary. That wasn't raised in the discussions uh, at the Strategic Stability Dialogue. If Russia were to move in that direction, we would deal with it decisively. Jake, just yes. another one. On, uh, the Russian proposal suggested uh, trying to reach some sort of agreement on uh, keeping exercises uh, away from the, the line of contact between NATO and, and, and Russia or limiting the deployment of, of, of missiles and other weapons. Is that, uh, is that something that's on the table from the U.S. perspective, or is that, uh, is that not something that the U.S. could ever agree to? As Deputy Secretary Sherman said in her readout of these meetings, and as was closely coordinated with allies and partners at NATO, we are prepared to discuss reciprocal limitations on the deployment of missiles as long as Russia is prepared to fulfill its end of the bargain and that there's adequate verification. So we are prepared to have a detailed negotiation on that, emphasis on detail because the devil is often in the details on those things. We also, as Deputy Secretary Sherman indicated in her readout of these discussions, have said we are prepared to discuss reciprocal parameters around the size and scope and frequency of military exercises, but reporting that has suggested we're going to reduce the number of troops we have deployed or somehow cut back on our overall force posture in Europe, those reports are wrong. Yes. I guess with no more talks scheduled with the Russians right now, as we sit here today, in your view, what is the likelihood of Russia invading? I'm not going to put any kind of likelihood on it. What I'm going to say is that the United States and our allies and partners are prepared for any contingency, any eventuality. We're prepared to keep moving forward down the diplomatic path in good faith, and we're prepared to respond if Russia acts. And beyond that, all we can do is get ready, and we are ready. Are yeah. they making the case, though, to invade, you believe? What do you mean by making the case? Is Russia trying to justify an invasion if one happens? I'm not going to put myself in the head of the Russians. As you see from their public comments, they've, been, they've said many different things, some of them contradictory. Um, they've Different speakers over the course of this week have given both hopeful signs and deeply pessimistic signs. You'll have to ask them uh, where they stand in respect to their positioning. From our perspective, 
we can just be clear about where we stand. And where we stand is ready to go down a principled path of diplomacy and ready to respond in the face of aggression. The White House has often talked about this, and you've talked about this in President Biden, about having this stable, predictable relationship with Russia. Given the back and forth over these talks and the threats, is that even still possible? We believe that diplomacy and diplomatic understandings that can be reached between the United States, our European allies and partners, and Russia can contribute to stability in Europe, that it is possible to make progress on things like missiles and exercises, as we just discussed, that ultimately we can get uh, updates to um, some of the underlying issues related to transparency and deconfliction, that we can get to risk reduction and conflict management so that the overall security situation in Europe is more stable. That is certainly viable if Russia is prepared to engage in a good faith way. If they're not and they choose to further invade Ukraine, then they are going to deal with the costs and consequences that the United States and our allies and partners will impose. Yeah. You're still saying if. Does that mean you're still uncertain whether Russia is negotiating in good faith? Well, the intelligence community has not uh, made an assessment that the Russians have definitively decided to take a military course of action in Ukraine. So as things stand right now, Russia uh, has uh, the opportunity to come to the table uh, as we go forward to deal with the very real concerns that we've put on the table, that Secretary Blinken has laid out publicly, and to negotiate in some of these areas that we've just been talking about. If Russia chooses to go a different path, we'll respond accordingly. But basically, we are still at a moment where we believe a path of diplomacy can uh, operate um, in a way that vindicates and reflects our interests and principles, and we're prepared to work with our allies and partners on that. I think we're united with the European Union, with NATO, with uh, Ukraine, with the rest of the countries of the Euro-Atlantic community uh, on the notion that there is a diplomatic path forward here. We are also united with our allies and partners that if Russia chooses to go a different way for whatever reason or no reason at all, well, we'll be ready for that. Ambassador Michael Carpenter is offering a different assessment. I'm sure you heard him say that the drumbeat of war is sounding loud and the rhetoric has gotten rather shrill. So do you agree with that or disagree? Well, the Russians have put tens of thousands of troops in and around Ukraine and, and occupied territory uh, relative to Ukraine. So it is certainly the case that the threat of military invasion is high. That's why I've stood at this podium repeatedly over the course of the past few months, warned about that, and laid out uh, what would uh, come as a result of that in respect to a response by the United States and our allies and partners. So there's no uh, illusions on the part of the United States government. There's no illusions on the part of any of us who have been dealing with this issue about what the prospects are for potential conflict and potential military escalation by Russia. The point that I would make today is that the United States and our European allies and partners are prepared for multiple different eventualities, an eventuality that has us at the negotiating table working on these issues in a serious and substantive way, and the eventuality that has us responding to what Russia does uh, in a clear, effective, forceful way that imposes significant costs on Russia for any action that it might take. Yeah. Um, on those actions, uh, looking at Europe right now, it doesn't seem necessarily that they're prepared to join uh, the aggressive multinational um, <coughs> sanctions package that the, that the U.S. has talked about. So if, if Vladimir Putin were to invade Russia tomorrow, are you confident that the sanctions that you've threatened uh, Moscow with and that you would want to see out of Europe are, are lined up, ready to go? And secondly, the Kremlin sort of picked uh, one element of sanctions legislation that's up on the Hill, the, the prospect of sanctioning Vladimir Putin uh, personally today, and uh, objected to that. I'm wondering, is that uh, among the sort of package that you've signaled to them is on the table for Ukraine to be uh, uh, invaded by Russia? Uh, the main focus of the sanctions package that we've been working with Europe on um, have been significant financial sanctions with a start high, stay high mentality, not a graduated application of these sanctions. Export controls that go at uh, certain fundamental strategic industries in Russia and other steps that we would take uh, to ensure that, that Russia actually had to deal with the economic consequences of this invasion. In terms of your question about uh, my level of confidence in our European allies and partners, 
I feel very good about the level of engagement and the level of convergence between the United States and Russia, A, on the fundamental proposition that there would have to be severe economic consequences, and B, on both the categories, types, and targets of sanctions uh, that would have to flow. Does that mean that the U.S. and Europe are going to have precisely the same list down to every last detail? No. Does it mean that I will be able to stand before you and say the United States and Europe have moved in unison on the application of severe economic measures? I'm confident that I will be able to do that. Can I ask a question about the cybersecurity meeting that you held today? Um, I'm wondering, in terms of the, the Log4j vulnerability, how many federal or if federal systems have been affected by that vulnerability, if it was because uh, the government hadn't done the necessary patchwork um, to, to prevent it from happening, and if the firms that you spoke with today made any commitments in terms of uh, you know, financial assistance or other assistance to maintain kind of critical open source software, since this seems to be a, an issue that continues to bubble up. So first, the President signed an executive order last year uh, that goes to uh, procurement of software by the United States government and fundamentally raises the game. And we're in the process of implementing that. And actually, where things stand with respect to departments and agencies of the U.S. government today as compared to nearly one year ago today when the President took office, we are in a much more robust posture. And that's due to the work uh, not just of uh, the interagency, but of specific departments and agencies that have implemented that executive order. In terms of the, the session today, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the companies in terms of the commitments they made, but it was an incredibly constructive discussion about ways that the public sector and the private sector can work effectively together to ensure that public sector systems are more robust and resilient and private sector systems are more robust and resilient. I'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, we will try to develop along with the participants in that meeting an agreed readout so that we're not betraying any confidences. Yeah. On uh, Russia and Ukraine, Secretary Blinken said at the start of the week that he didn't expect any major breakthroughs this week, but that one positive outcome could obviously be a de-escalation of tensions. Given the current state of play, given everything that you've said, what specifically does that look like from your view, Russia de-escalating right now? Uh, it would involve them uh, reducing the number of forces that they have deployed in aggressive postures towards Ukraine. That would ultimately be a key part of de-escalation. There are other steps that Russia could take in respect to de-escalation uh, that go far beyond Ukraine as well. But in terms of uh, the proximate challenge in and around the border of Ukraine, that would be an important step. I would also say one other thing that I think is very important that, Tony, you mentioned Secretary Blinken's comments at the beginning of the week. He said something at the end of, the la of last week that I want to underscore, which is that our intelligence community has uh, developed information, which has now been downgraded, that Russia is laying the groundwork to have the option of fabricating a pretext for an invasion, including through sabotage activities and information operations, by accusing Ukraine of preparing an imminent attack against Russian forces in eastern Ukraine. We saw this playbook in 2014. Uh, they are preparing this playbook again, and, the, and we will have, the administration will have further details on what we see as this potential laying of a pretext to share with the press over the course of the next 24 hours. Yeah. Okay, so on the flip side of that, I mean, you've been clear that the U.S. will respond in, in the face of, of Russian aggression, but I'm trying to get a sense of what the U.S. would need to see in order to actually respond. Would it have to be tanks and troops crossing the border, or would things like moving helicopters and, and tactical weapons be enough for the U.S. to take steps to impose sanctions? When you say moving helicopters and tactical weapons, you mean onto the territory yeah. of Ukraine? Yeah. Our position is quite straightforward. If the Russian military moves across the Ukrainian frontier to seize territory, we believe that that is the further invasion of Ukraine, and it will trigger a response from the United States and the international community. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. Um, I want to ask about your current policy in this crisis. But first, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to ask something of a historical nature first. Um, I assume, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that in preparation for President Biden's first summit with President Putin, held in Geneva last June, the national security team undertook a comprehensive review of the official documentary record of all the interactions that President Trump had with President Putin. You may recall during the Trump presidency, we saw reporting to the effect that Mr. Trump and or his aides took some steps to uh, prevent the uh, maintenance of a full record of those interactions. Um, without asking you to disclose any classified information, can you assure us on two points? Number one, 
did your review uncover any evidence of any effort at any point along the way in the creation and storage of those records uh, to tamper with that process? And number two, did your review uncover any evidence of any impropriety of any kind or severity on the part of President Trump in his interactions with President Putin? Uh, on that question, I've got nothing for you. Okay. So current policy then. Um, this administration has tried without success to use sanctions to compel the military in Myanmar to abandon its coup d'etat. This administration has used sanctions without success to compel China to release the concentration camp inmates in Xinjiang. The Obama administration, of course, used sanctions without success to try to deter a Russian annexation of Crimea. Here you stand again, brandishing the threat of sanctions to try to deter a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Why shouldn't this be perceived as clinging to a failed tactic? And why shouldn't President Putin assess on that basis that his adversary is operating from a position of relative weakness? President Putin has indicated that what he does not want to see uh, is further NATO force posture coming closer to his border. President Putin has indicated that what he does not want to see is further American uh, and allied support uh, to Ukraine. President Putin has indicated that what he does want to see is the further strengthening of Russian strategic industries in the Russian economy. We have laid out on all of those metrics that Russia um, will suffer costs and consequences in the event of a further invasion of Ukraine. And he can make his own determination about what he wants to do. But the United States is going to act. We're going to act with our allies and partners on those issues in those ways. We have the capacity to do that, and we will do that. And President Biden has been clear that that's what we intend to do. Have you seen sanctions yeah. work? Well, so first, I would say that if you go back to uh, a personal experience I had, which was the negotiation of the first the interim agreement and then contributing to uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, we do believe that economic pressure on Iran had a meaningful impact on bringing it to the table and ultimately putting a lid on its nuclear program. There are other instances where sanctions have worked. And of course, there are instances across administrations, Democrat and Republican alike, where sanctions have not achieved the full result. Uh, and so I'm not going to stand before you and say sanctions are a panacea. They're a tool that solves every problem. But remember, sanctions are only one part of the way that we and our allies are talking about how we will deal with a potential Russian invasion of Ukraine. We have other tools to bring to bear as well. Those tools also bear on the interests and the security capacities of the Russian Federation. And our goal at the end of the day here is not to get into an escalatory spiral. It is to find a way forward uh, consistent with our principles, consistent with our interests, and consistent with open, transparent consultation with our allies uh, to pursue diplomacy. If that works, great. If that doesn't work, we're ready. Yeah. Uh, with all of that said, is the window of time closing when it comes to diplomacy on this issue? And when you talk about options that are on the table, you said sanctions is one of the tools. What are the other options? Presidents have. Uh, a whole host of options, and they've always said when they are met with these types of situations, all options are on the table. Are all options on the table for this moment? Well, we've been clear uh, both directly to the Russians, and we've actually been clear publicly about some of the other options. And they include changes in the forces and capabilities that the United States and NATO would deploy to eastern flank allies to reinforce uh, and strengthen the robustness of allied defense on allied territory. We've made clear that in the event of an invasion, in addition to the support we are currently providing to the Ukrainians, we would dramatically ramp up that support uh, to support their territory and te territorial integrity and sovereignty. We've also been clear that we are uh, going to work in tandem with allies and partners, not just in Europe, but in other parts of the world, on export controls that would have an impact on strategic industries in Russia. So those are some of the extra, the additional tools that we can bring to bear in this context. All of them go to the basic proposition that the United States is going to look to strengthen and reinforce our position and our allies' position and to support the Ukrainians in the event of an invasion, a uh, further invasion of Ukraine. But what about the window of opportunity for diplomacy? Is that closing, as I asked earlier? Look. It's hard for me to characterize where things stand on the diplomacy, because we've come through these four days. We need to sit and consult with allies and partners. Uh, Wendy Sherman is just getting off a plane. She may have gotten off a plane in the last few hours. We'll take stock of where we are. We'll consult, and then we'll determine next steps. 
the Russians will have to do the same. And all I can tell you is, as far as we're concerned, we are ready to move forward on diplomacy, and we are ready to go down the other path. Uh, and both of those, in my view, that question of which path is one that is facing us now. It's not facing us a year from now or five years from now. It's facing us in the, in the foreseeable future. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, what happens if nothing happens? I mean, if Russia doesn't invade Ukraine but keeps like this uh, massive amount of troops at the border, is this something you can live with? In this case, would there be sanctions, less sanctions, no sanctions at all? So we're trying to, first of all, deter and prevent a, a potentially massive Russian invasion. That's step number one. If we end up in a circumstance of the kind you describe, we'll deal with that as it comes, but I'm not going to get into hypotheticals today in terms of our reaction. I'll just take one more question. Uh, to follow up, but at this moment, are we in a position where what the next step is reducing the troops at the board, on the borders of Ukraine? Is this the next thing that can happen that could satisfy the U.S. and the Allies? What do you mean by the next thing? What would, after the week we've had, what are we expecting? That they take, of course, we're hoping that they, they but they, they, the, the, the Russian troops uh, back off. But is this the only next step possible? Uh, of course, there's the invasion, but uh, after the entire week of diplomacy. Well, what, what we've said all along is that we're happy to talk. We're happy to talk about our interests and our concerns. We're happy to listen to the Russians talk about their interests and their concerns. But we've also been very clear from the beginning that to make concrete progress, real tangible progress, it has to happen in an environment of de-escalation. So we will have to see now on the diplomatic path what comes next. We'll have to determine that first with our friends and then in engagement with the Russians. And as I stand here today, I can't tell you what the next steps will be. Uh, I can only tell you that um, the United States, the Biden administration, our allies and partners were prepared uh, to deal with whatever comes. Just the, the ambiance uh, 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 in the negotiation today. I mean, you, you've, you made reference to the pessimist or uh, the different uh, uh, statements we heard, but the Russian uh, of officials had a, a more pessimistic and, and negative <coughs> tone. D did they have the same tone when you, they were face to face with the? They were professional and businesslike. We clearly disagreed on things, and there were areas where both sides saw there was a possibility for progress. Beyond that, it's hard for me really to characterize their point of view. They can characterize it for themselves. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you so much, Jake.